Hello, class. We're good. We're here with Peter Dekumba. Dekumba. Yeah. Um, which is That's hard, right? Uh, from the uh, recently planted the Emmanuel Community Church uh, here in Kingwood. Um, we're going to start. He's going to tell us his uh, wonderful testimony. Uh, so we want to hear that, and then we'll talk a little bit about his, uh, his church plant and how that's going. Yeah. Peter, all yours. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for having me and giving this opportunity to share my testimony. I'm in Roma here. It's a, it's a blessing to me. Uh, so like uh, he said, my name is Peter, and I'm originally from Rwanda. And most of you have uh, heard about Rwanda because of genocide that took place in 1994. And uh, 1995 was 14 years old. And, and uh, uh, you may think, oh, you look like young, but I'm actually, <laughs> I am, uh, 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 today is my birthday. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Oh, no, thank you. I turned 42. So um, 1995 was 14 years old. So uh, let me tell you about my testimony. I was born uh, in a rural area, you know, in the village of Rwanda. And uh, life was very different. Uh, you know, we uh, grew up, you know, in a place where we did not have enough food. Uh, it was, uh, you know, if you ate dinner, there was no lunch, or if you ate lunch, there was no dinner. We knew nothing about the breakfast or you know, anything like snacks or things of that nature. Uh, nothing did not exist. Uh, I did not have my first pair of shoes until I was nine years old. And, and so life was uh, very different and hopeless. And, uh, and as far as uh, uh, relationship with God, I did not have any relationship with God. I grew up in a family. We were Catholic. So we were going to church um, uh, like on Christmas, on big days, you know, East, uh, but not really participating or having any real relationship with Jesus. And, uh, uh, but my dad had wished that one of his kids would be a priest, and that was me. He wanted me to be a priest, but I really had no idea what that meant and because I wasn't really participating. And uh, so you talk about genocide, and uh, now I jump from that nine years old to 15, 14 years old. That when was my age when genocide was taking place. So in the village, it was very different. Um, you're talking about uh, your friends coming against you, like the people that you act with and uh, coming against you. They were killing us because of our tribe. So uh, in our country, we had uh, three tribes, Twa, Tutsi, and Hutu. Hutu was the majority and Twa was the minority, while uh, they were even less than 5%. So, um, uh, the Hutu, I mean, the Tutsi were about 15% of the population. So it was, uh, 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 that was our tribe. But, but my mom actually is a uh, mixed tribe. So uh, that complicated it even in the genocide. Uh, before genocide, we knew no tribe. Like people of my age, we did not know anything about the tribe. Uh, until when genocide was taking place um, in 1994 and you got to school, and the teacher will ask you, hey, tell me your tribe. And you're like, I don't know what my tribe is. And they, you gotta go ask your parents. But, uh, you know, then your parents don't wanna talk about it because they know it's gonna cause, you know, a lot of uh, issues and they want to protect you. They don't want you to know your tribe because you're gonna tear everybody. And they know it's gonna be dangerous. So, uh, but you have heard uh, about the genocide. And if you haven't, you can watch the Hotel in Rwanda, the movie. It doesn't give the, you know, the whole picture, it just gives a glimpse. So for me, Hotel in Rwanda, that was my life, uh, but it was even worse than that. And uh, so in genocide, uh, I have, um, we are six siblings of us and I'm number three in our family. And uh, so we are trying to survive. You know, there were uh, people who are called Interahamwe. Interahamwe was a group of people that had been trained uh, by the government and they weren't military, but they were trained to kill and destroy our tribe. And uh, these guys had weapons, uh, they had machetes, they had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, they had uh, spears, uh, they had, some of them had guns. 
and uh, if they found you and you are a Tutsi, they killed you. And uh, so whenever we heard about them, whenever they were coming to our village, uh, you gotta go hide because if you don't, they're gonna catch you and they're gonna kill you. There were so many roadblocks in a, in a, uh, you know, in a village and even across the country. And the people who are there were to the humble. So uh, now genocide is going on and people are coming against their, you know, the Tutsis, they are killing them, they are looking for them, whatever they are, they are calling them, you know, snakes or the vipers, uh, calling them uh, roaches because they are hiding and like, we got to kill them whenever we want to eliminate them. And uh, so my dad and my uncle, they had to take our two families together so we can go and hide in, in the woods. And uh, so um, remember I said, I have six, uh, we have six siblings of us. And my big uh, brother, we, couldn't, we don't know where he had gone. You can't find him. And so was my big sister. Now in the genocide, when someone is gone, they're gone. Because we're talking about a time when you don't have your cell phones, you, don't, you can't text, you can't do anything. So there's no way you can track them. And because uh, there's so much chaos, so you are following the crowd. And that was the case with my brother and my sister. So uh, when they took our two families in the woods, we are trying to survive and hide, and we have no food. The food, all the food we tried to take with us, it's all gone. And uh, so one morning, uh, we had to spend about two weeks, and food is gone. We are starving. You know, we have no food, we are fainting. And my dad and my mom, they're afraid that uh, my, young, my young siblings are gonna die because there's no food. And so one morning, my dad and my uncle, they were like, hey, we need to go look for something to eat because we're gonna die anyway. And uh, now that I was a big kid, and so they were like, okay, you're gonna come with us. Uh, we don't know what's gonna happen. If something goes wrong, we can come back and tell you know, the family, whatever that's going to be happening. Um, and so they took me with them. In the early morning, we left. And uh, when we went, um, like they were thinking, we met the group of Terham, the member who they are, they are trained to kill and destroy. And we met them. And when we met them, they knew who we were because, you know, we were very identical. Everybody can see, can know that my dad is a Tutsi, that, you know, my tribe, like you can't hide it. And uh, so they grabbed my uncle. After they captured the all of us, they grabbed my uncle and um, they chopped his head off. And uh, when they did that, um, now it's me and my dad. And um, I look into the face of my dad and and he looks into my face and we can't, we can't talk by what point when my mind is that this is my last time to see you. And he's thinking the same, but we can't communicate. And uh, that moment, I remembered uh, a story my mom had used to tell me uh, that when I was about six years old, that there's something powerful in this thing is called God. And that if I ever find myself in trouble, this thing can help me. I remember I used to ask, her, is the thing called God powerful than a witch doctor? Because a witch doctor in our village, he was so powerful. If, if a witch said, you're going to die, you die the next day. You know, the witch talk about the Harry Potter, the, 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 Harry Potter, the movie. Uh, to me, that, is, that was a real. It's like witches wouldn't fry, witches would do those things. And so I grew up scared of witches. And now uh, my mom was telling me that the witch is, is less powerful. You know, she's not, the witch is not as powerful as that. And so that kind of thing stuck in my mind. So now in this moment that I am going to die, I feel like this is my last moment to live. I felt like someone is whispering into my ears and he's reminding me, remember I saw your mom and told you, I was like, yeah, yeah. And, and then I felt like I need to make a vow to that thing called God. 
And from my heart, I said, you think you call the God. If you are real, save me right now. And if you save him, I'm going to serve you forever. And that moment, uh, when I said those words from my heart, because my body was shaking. So I, 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 I wasn't saying anything other than just, you know, thinking through my, my heart, my mind. And then we saw, my dad and I saw uh, Captain Emmanuel. Uh, Captain Emmanuel, he was on the side of the military that was fighting to stop the genocide. And he came, and behind him were uh, about seven other guys, uh, you know, wearing the military uniform. And uh, when he came, uh, the guys that were going to, to kill me and my dad saw him, and they took off. And his military chased him, but Captain Emmanuel came close to us, and he said, my name is Captain Emmanuel, I'm here to rescue you. And so he rescued me and my dad. He took us to a safe place and where we lived uh, for about three months. And all those three months, we have no communication with our family, with anybody, because we were just with the, all the other Tutsis that had been rescued and put in a safe place. And then after genocide, uh, we came back to our village and we were able to reunite with uh, with our family and my sister didn't show up until uh, almost three years. She ended up in Burundi, adopted by a uh, Burundian family and, and better along she came home, uh, you know, with uh, uh, just, you know, with uh, her languages and was, uh, you know, embracing to see how I get. Uh, but uh, and go, go back a little bit. So after genocide, I go, I go we come back to our village and uh, now, my dad had told him, I want to serve God the rest of my life. But I, honestly, I don't know. Where do I start? Do that? And he's like, yeah, you go become a priest. And so we start the, the initial process of, you know, becoming a priest, which was to give you a school reports. And one day I submitted it. And that same day, the younger lady in our village, she had given her, her life to Christ and joined the, this stranger church that is not a Catholic, that is, you know, different. And so, uh, but she came to share the gospel with us, uh, but I was not at home. And when I come back from uh, the church, the Catholic uh, priest's office, and, and uh, they told me, she had been our house and she had come to invite all of us to go to our church, but nobody was like, who is gonna to go to our church? That's a new thing. And that moment, the voice that whispered to me when, when I was going to die kind of came back and I was convinced that that is the church I need to go and join. And it was a very small church, the size of a Starbucks, but the people were very excited, very rejoicing and the, for the first time, when I went there for the first time, someone who is not related to me, they're calling me brother. And I was like, what is this? Uh, but uh, after church, uh, after the service, I talked to the pastor. I told him, look, I want to serve God the rest of my life, but I don't know, someone help me. How do I start? And I, I feel like that's the place, you know, I need to be going to, to worship. And so the pastor, helped me begin my journey with Jesus officially and got baptized and, um, um, I, you know, I was number one in our whole family, uh, relatives who have a genuine relationship with Jesus. And, and uh, after that, you know, I was still uh, 14. And, and, and so I uh, went to high school and, and from high school, I went to uh, uh, Bible College, and uh, from there, I became pastor of the churches in Africa and helped with international adoption. So, uh, when I was in Rwanda, I helped with uh, American families to adopt children from Africa to here. And I think that was my yeah, initial relationship with, you know, um, Americans. And um, when I was young, God had told me he was going to send me to America, but that was the time I didn't even speak English, uh, but I, you know, trust him. And, and so uh, after Bible college, I, you know, I got married and, and planned the church. And then uh, about 10 years ago, uh, 
almost 10 years ago, the Lord sent us here uh, to Cable, Texas, and we came with the mission to Southwood here, as he had taught us. And so uh, that's basically a little bit of Johnny uh, background. That's the whole reason I'm here, I came here because uh, he sensed that God's calling on us to come back to church here. So. And you went to Champion Forest for a while, didn't you? Yes. So uh, when I came here to Kingo, um, and uh, you know, when you come, you want to plant a church, but there aren't many churches that are planting churches. There are great churches, but not all the churches are planting churches. So uh, a friend of mine introduced me to HCPA, she's in church planting in Edgewater, uh, which uh, Champion for the Start Church. Uh, sponsors and uh, support and and so uh, when I joined the Houston Church Planting Network uh, they uh, back then it was a uh, uh, Dr. Um, David Fremming was I think uh, on the uh, on the leadership team and uh, and then so they uh, they marched they gave me an anchor church uh, so they invited me to come and be on the staff of Champion Forest for 12 months and I actually had an office as a champion. And so I mean, I was uh, getting ready to plant this church. And so uh, February, 20, February 16th, 2020, we did our, our official uh, grand opening of the church. What a great time to do that, right? <laughs> 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 One month later, COVID. Yes, yes, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I noticed just for. So people don't, it's not lost on them for sure in the name of the church. Uh, uh, probably more than coincidence. Uh, uh, people demanding that uh, showed up at the right time. Yes. Uh, and also I want to mention that uh, the Emmanuel, the captain, um, when after genocide, when we wanted to go and, you know, look for him, say thank you, you know, things of that nature, we couldn't find him. Yes. Uh, you know, there's no way that they don't even know him in the military records. And um, uh, I, we, we think uh, he was a human being, even though he was, you know, uh, uh, you know like he rescued us, he was in military uniform. He told us he was captain in the air, but we went to, you know, the military and we asked him his name. And he said, no, they said they don't know him, you know, there's no way. And a uh, few years later, I was speaking at a church in Tennessee, and there was a Rwandan family uh, who told me that they were rescued by Captain Emmanuel, but they would never. So, and, wow. so we know Captain Emmanuel was rescuing people, but uh, it could be God's angel, could it be Jesus himself. It would be the first time you know, uh, God sending the divine captain to rescue, you know, people uh, in the Bible, there are stories of that. Mm -hmm. So you were, uh, uh, before we started, you were telling us about the church, uh, mid-February, yeah. right? And yes. you met how many times before? <laughs> it yeah. didn't go very far no, because of COVID, no. right? Yeah, so we, tell, them, tell them about that. Yeah, we, we met three times. We met three times, and the fourth time we couldn't meet because you know YMCA was closed, and um, you know it was very difficult. Very difficult. You know when I did the the uh, the internship, uh, you know uh, whether uh, at the Champion Forest, you know whether even with the choosing the church planting in to work, it seemed a lot of training, but nobody told us that the, the, you know the COVID was coming and how are we gonna how we are going to prepare for it. So it was very difficult, uh, but uh, given my background, uh, we planted churches. Before I came to America, we planted, the, uh, I was a part of the team that we planted 29 churches in Rwanda. And so some of them, uh, we met outside. And, you know, obviously not as hot as Texas, <laughs> you know, but uh, met outside and, uh, and, and so I would say that I, I have learned to live uh, with few, like with few, uh, you don't have, you can still watch the Jesus even though you don't have 
the music, the cameras, and you know, all this uh, stuff that we, a lot of times we want to embrace that they make our worship. Um, so that's uh, basically what we were doing during that time. We worshiped under uh, the school pavilion, and uh, a lot of people say that we were about 75, and, and we were there. I think the number came down to about three families. And, uh, and then we stuck together and we prayed, and we prayed for all of that. And, uh, and so when the wife see it, you we when, when was that? When did y'all get to meet, you know, indoors again? Indoors again, after the first of, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, it was, uh, uh, it was uh, it was Hard for a plant church. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was uh, totally different from all the other churches. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, okay. but definitely a unique event. Nobody, yes. Nobody saw it coming like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but uh, you gotta remember, Jesus doesn't change. You know, in the good times and bad times, he doesn't change. He doesn't lower his standards. He doesn't say you'll be okay in COVID. Uh, you know, or you're gonna watch to me when life is easy when things are comfortable uh but he's still gonna wash me in because of who he is 